Welcome to Cars Yeah, show number 75. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. Do you love vintage cars? Then go to CarsYeah.com and get a free copy of the fantastic Filler Up book. It's a full-color ebook filled with fuel filler fun with over 60 color photographs of vintage cars plus inspirational quotes from some of the most famous automotive enthusiasts of all time. Simply go to CarsYeah.com, click on the free book button on the home page, and download your Filler Up book today. It's free at CarsYeah.com. Today's part one of a very special two-part show with the legendary Peter Brock. Don't miss the second part of this interview at CarsYeah.com, iTunes, or Stitcher Radio. Hello, automotive enthusiasts. Today, I am very excited to introduce my friend and a very special guest here on Cars Yeah, Peter Brock. Peter, are you buckled up and ready for a fun ride? Absolutely. I got uh, got the shoulder straps all cinched down tight and uh, about ready to turn on the key. All right. I love it. Where do I begin when introducing an iconic legend in the automotive world? Peter Brock is a designer, a racer, an award-winning author, a speaker, and a photographer. He was the youngest designer to be hired at General Motors in 1957 and sketched what became the first Corvette Stingray. In 1961, Peter became Carroll Shelby's first employee and designed the iconic Daytona Coupe that won the world championship in 1965. There were other cars he designed while with Shelby, and he worked on the iconic Shelby GT350 Mustang. His Brock Racing Enterprises, the BRE team with Datsun, is legendary and won title after title. In 1973, he founded Ultralight Products that became the largest hang gliding company in the world and they won numerous championships and set records in hang gliding. Today, alongside his wife Gail and their talented team, Peter continues to push BRE into new adventures and products, including his unique AeroVault trailer and the brand new YouTube series, Peter Brock's World. So Peter, I've told our listeners just a little about your legendary life. Please take some time and share some more about your history, your career, your interests, and of course, your incredible passion for automobiles. Well, Mark, you know, I've just been involved with cars since I was about uh, 12 years old. I was fortunate enough to have a a really great neighbor, a guy named Fritz Warren, who had an MGTC. And this is, you know, back in 1948. And that was really an unusual car at that time. And it was very exciting because Fritz wanted to race the car. And, of course, it was a right-hand drive car. And in those days, nobody had trailers. Everybody drove their cars to the races, and it was usually in a gaggle of cars. So I got to sit in the left-hand seat, which was, you know, facing all the oncoming traffic and straight pipe, no windscreen, and a whole bunch of guys rat racing on the roads to wherever we were going. In those days, that you know, it was in the Bay Area. We were out of Sausalito at that time. So we'd go to you know, Sacramento or Pebble Beach or Lodi or whatever it was, but it was always on the road with a great bunch of guys. And uh, in those days, there wasn't much traffic, and it was just a, such an exciting thing for a 12-year-old kid to do. Oh, yeah. You know, that's really where I, I, you know, fell in love with automobiles and then later took my first job working after school down at Bill Breeze's sports car shop in Sausalito, just sweeping the floors, wiping up tools whatever it could be that uh, was exciting just for me to hang around and, and all of these neat cars. And of course the, the Jaguar XK120 came in at that time, which was just an incredibly modern automobile uh, for that period. So I got to see the whole evolution of the sports car movement in the United States, just fell in love with cars and, and have really never done much else other than uh, be involved in the automotive industry one way or another starting out either sweeping the floor or, you know, later working as a designer or running my own team or driving myself, whatever it's been, it's always been just a, you know, a really, really fun ride. Oh, yeah, and that's quite an understatement to say you've never been involved with very much other than cars because 
The life you've lived is a dream for so many enthusiasts. And for Cars Yeah, the listener here, to be inspired by what you've done is a wonderful thing. Now, you were hired by GM at a very young age to come in and work around some really talented people. Can you talk a little bit about those days at GM? Well, it, it was really unusual because I was going to art center school and uh, was being financed through the school by my, my mother at the time. And uh, she really wasn't too keen on my being in the automotive business, but uh, wanted me to be an architect. And uh, I had, you know, looked at that for a while and just, you know, I was still very much in the hot rod culture of California at that time. So I had gone down to art center and said, this is what I want to do. And after Oh, about my fifth semester, she just said, okay, you're on your own. And uh, I didn't have the money to finish uh, school at that time. So uh, by that time, made the acquaintance of Chuck Jordan, who later became the uh, uh, vice president of design for uh, for General Motors Styling. And uh, I, I called Chuck and uh, told him what the situation was. And the guy just said, we'll have an airplane ticket for you tomorrow. Come on back. Oh, wow. And that's... Uh, pretty much the way I got hired into GM. I went back there, you know, did about a one hour interview and they said, okay, you got six months to make it. And uh, they hired me and, uh, you know, it was just such an incredible thing that other people helped, you know, without the timing and the people that helped uh, at that time to get into that uh, incredible spot at the age of 19 and then uh, the whole political situation within uh, General Motors at that time was that the what they call the AMA ban, the American Automobile Manufacturers Ban on Performance and Racing, came in 1957, just at that time. So to make a long story short, the Corvette program was going to be uh, completely cut off. Uh, it hadn't been a success at General Motors because uh, when Harley Earl had uh, come up with the idea. He, he came up with the idea of building cars and fiberglass. It was going to be a, a sports car. And there was nothing like that in Detroit at that time. Uh, you know, this is the Midwest thinking very, very conservative. And Ford really got the jump on him with the, uh, with the Thunderbird in, uh, in 1955. The Corvette came out in 54 as a, a little sports car with no roll up and down windows and made out of fiberglass. And it was just the beginnings of what it could be, but it had been done on such a small budget that it wasn't very, very successful. And then Ford came out with the uh, with the Thunderbird and absolutely killed them in sales. Uh, you know, they're out selling them three or four to one. So at that point, General Motors just decided that uh, they were going to kill off the Corvette program. And if anything, uh, they were going to... Uh, look at the whole program and they wanted it turned into something that would be competitive with the Corvette, which was really a personal car, but it was a very, very good car. It had roll up and down windows, uh, you know, all the thing, all the accoutrements that the, uh, the American public could expect in a, in a two place car. So they asked um, Harley Earl, who was leading uh, GM styling at that time to uh, come up with a, uh, concept which would compete with the uh, with the Thunderbird and uh, he took a uh, a lead off a car that he'd done in uh, 1956 called the Golden Rocket for the uh, General Motors Motorama and designed a General Motors Thunderbird you know competitor and of course Chevrolet looked at this and it wasn't anything like they'd started out with the Corvette and you've got to realize that you had four really great people at GM at that time that believed in the car. And that was Harley Earl who came up with the concept to begin with. Um, of course, Zora Duntoff, who was brought in to be the, the guide and to, uh, to make it a, a better car, more like a sports car than they wanted to be. And of course, um, uh, Ed Cole, who had designed all the overhead valve engines for GM at that time. And, and eventually a small block Chevrolet went into the Corvette and, and, and made it a great car, and it began to sell. And, of course, the guy that kept it all going was Bill Mitchell, who eventually uh, took over from Harley Earl. All these people conspired in secret to build a new Corvette against uh, management's uh, dictums uh, to build a, a Thunderbird a competitor. So here I was at that time. Uh, I'd just been in there about six months. And normally such a program would have been uh, delegated to the uh, the Chevrolet studio upstairs. 
but because the uh, the program had been curtailed by management, uh, there could be no hint that anything of this type was going on. So Bill Mitchell decided that he would take this car and do it in secret, and he took it downstairs to the uh, Research B studio, which was kind of an intern studio where I was at that time where advanced concepts were developed, and uh, presented it to uh, four young designers that were in there, told them what he wanted to do, that the project was secret, and essentially turned the project over to four young designers, uh, and we got to uh, interpret all of his wishes. He, he laid out everything that he wanted the car to be like. He had gone over to uh, the Turin show in the summer or fall of uh, 1957, and had seen some beautiful little streamliners over there that were being built by you know, Farina and, and uh, Abarth, and uh, they were all very, very sort of similar in concept, that they had this beautiful aerodynamic shape with sort of a crisp belt line around them and four s- simple aerodynamic shapes over the wheels. And that sort of became the uh, the basic brief that he gave us in a number of photographs that he laid out. And uh, we began putting our sketches up on the wall, and he'd pick out the various aspects of different things that we'd put out and select those for the design. And slowly, slowly, the design evolved into what he wanted. And I was fortunate enough that uh, he picked a lot of my work. And eventually, one particular sketch that I did in November of 57, he said, okay, that's it. That's the direction we're going. And that car, it took six years from the development of that uh, particular sketch of November 57 till the Corvette was produced as the first C2 uh, split window Corvette in 1963 took six years, but uh, it finally came about. (laughs) It's just an incredible story. And I want to remind our listeners, there is a spectacular book that Peter published last year. It's called The Corvette Stingray, Genesis of an American Icon. And you can learn all about this, the secretness of designing this car and Peter's involvement by going to uh, Peter's website at BRE, and we'll we'll post that on the show notes page and talk about it more. But that book is absolutely amazing, and there's stories in that book that nobody had ever heard before that came out, and Peter was right there involved with all of it. So a uh, really fun story. Let's move ahead a little bit in the time frame here, and you were hired as Carol Shelby's first employee. That is absolutely incredible. Another icon in the motor racing industry and automotive industry. Could you tell us about some of your times there? And I know your involvement with the Daytona Coupe is legendary, but maybe uh, share some of that time you spent there with with old Carol. Well, it it was interesting because I said, you know, I went to work uh, for GM when I was 19. But my whole goal at that time, I mean, from the time I was 12 years old and going racing with Fritz and the the whole crew at the the sports car center there in Sausalito was that I wanted to be a race driver. And I didn't, I was really very serious about it, but you know, like every other young kid that wants to be a race driver, your dreams far, far exceed your ability. <laughs> sure. So my backup, my fallback plan, of course, was that I went down to the art center school in Los Angeles and, uh, you know, decided that I would uh, get involved in automotive design. That way I could be both, part of the racing scene because General Motors was deeply involved in racing at that time, even though most of it was out the back door. It gave me a chance to see what was really going on in the racing game sure. and gave me some time until I turned 21. As soon as I was 21, I uh, I, I had bought a, a used race car when I was 20 and started rebuilding it in a, in a little shop that I built behind the farmhouse I was living in out in Detroit and wanted to get back to California and start racing. So I, I left GM and my design career and uh, headed back out to California. And at that point in my first races, I got to know Max Belchowski, who was a great, I mean, a great, great thinker in, in racing uh, in Southern California at that time because he was using his own hand-built car I mean, literally hand-built. He he bent all the tubes on the floor in his shop and used the Buick engine in it and put it together with so-called junkyard parts. But he was really a brilliant uh, self-taught engineer. So that um, in working for Max during the day chasing parts and he helped me at night with my race car, uh, I got to know a, a lot of the racers in Southern California. And the primary one that came in one night was, uh, was Carol Shelby. 
Carroll had just won Le Mans in 1959 with uh, Roy Salvadori driving for Aston Martin and uh, decided that uh, he was going to quit racing. He had a heart problem, but he wanted to finish out the season, and uh, he wanted to drive an American car, and he made a deal with Max to drive the old Yeller at uh, a few of the last races of the season. So that's where I got to know Carroll, and he told me about his dream about uh, building a new sports car and also about his desire to start a race driver school out at Riverside Raceway. So the, the long story is that uh, uh, another American driver, a really good one, was Paul O'Shea, uh, who was one of the factory drivers in America for Mercedes-Benz, along with John Fitch. Paul and, and Carol decided that they were going to start this race driver school, and it was you know, kind of a, an ethereal thing at that time. And, and at that time, both of them had huge egos, and Paul, of course, thought, Shelby was going to work for Paul and vice versa. <laughs> so when it finally came out to the, we went out to the track, I went out to the track to look over the facilities with them. They got in a big argument about who was going to run the track and uh, Paul stomped off. And <laughs> Carol turned to me and he said, well, I, I don't have time to run this thing. Do you want it? Can you run this thing for me? And I said, sure. I mean, here was a chance to drive race cars every day. Yeah. Be out on the race track, work for Carol Shelby. And uh, I only think I only had about seven races in my logbook at that time. Fortunately, uh, we just started working on the Cobra program, which is another story I'll get back to. But our lead uh, test driver at that time was Ken Miles, another great, great race oh, driver yeah. in Southern California. And uh, Ken came out during the development of the Cobra. Uh, I had a chance to spend hours with him on the racetrack going around and he taught me everything that I knew about racing, which I transferred and put into the, the curriculum of the Shelby School. So it really should have been the Ken Miles School of High Performance Driving, but with Carol's name, that's the name we put on it. For the next couple of years, intermittently, uh, uh, I ran that, ran that school and spent a lot of time on the racetrack and got to know many, many people in the industry and racing. And, and uh, uh, as it turned out, we... Uh, we won the uh, United States Road Racing Championship in 1963 with the Cobra Roadsters, and then Carroll decided that he wanted to go to Europe. And, of course, the Cobra was a fantastic car on America, short tracks. You know, most of the tracks were about two-and-a-half-mile uh, length, but going to Europe was a whole different thing. I mean, we had straightaways over there that were longer than that, for example, at Le Mans or at Spa or at Monza. So with a top speed of about 165 mile an hour for the Cobra Roadsters, there was no way that we were going to compete with the Ferrari GTOs. And so it introduced that car in 1962 at the Paris Auto Show, and it instantly became the winning car. Uh, Aston Martin had the great 212s. Of course, uh, Jaguar had the E-types, but the GTO was the car. It was almost unbeatable. So for the first two years, 62 and 63, Enzo ruled uh, Europe with the GT class over there. Carroll decided he was going to go back over and compete against him. So the big problem was how do we make a faster Cobra? Now, Carroll was not a very technical guy. He didn't really understand what it was that made a, a great race driver. He was, first of all, uh, a great, great salesman and also a very good driver, but he really had no real engineering background or understanding what made cars go fast. So when I explained that uh, we had some secret horsepower in changing the body design and could get some more speed out of it with the same amount of horsepower because we were pretty much tapped out at that time in terms of overall horsepower for the 289 Ford that was in the Cobras. That was about 385 horsepower. Mm -hmm. Not much chance of getting much more out of it, but I explained that you know, if you double the speed of the car, the drag goes up by the square. Or if you want to even get more speed, you've got to cube the horsepower. So he just said, I don't understand any of that. Can you make it go faster? And I said, <laughs> well, it may be a little unorthodox, but I, I've i got some information that uh, I think that we could apply to the, uh, to the new rules that uh, had come about because uh, Enzo Ferrari had actually had the rules changed to build the GTO, it was called the GTO, which was Gran Turismo Homologato. Under the initial rules, uh, the manufacturers had to submit 
all the specifications for their their car, and they were allowed slight changes each year under a rule that was called evolution of type. They could change the grill or the fender openings or wheels or whatever. But uh, he decided under that rule that he would change the complete body, and of course, the uh, competition committee for the FIA rejected that completely. Hmm. So he went uh, around to all the people individually on the competition board who also happened to own racetracks all over Europe and said, if you don't allow me to come and build a special car with my own special body, I won't attend your races next year. So they all reversed. (laughs) Came up with the Appendix J, which allowed a complete new body on the existing frame. Ah, And that was the thing that opened the door for... uh, Aston Martin to build the 212, and of course Jaguar to build the uh, the lightweight uh, cars, and of course it opened the door for us to do the uh, the Daytona. Wow! So that was the big big change that uh, uh, we couldn't change the chassis at all. The chassis had to remain to the same basic dimensions; it could be strengthened, which we did because it was very very flexible. But uh, I came up with the uh, the line for the Daytona. Uh, and those were actually based on uh, some German aerodynamic studies, which had been done in the late 1930s at the studios that were run uh, FKFS at, by Wunderbald Kahn in Germany. And a very young designer at that time, a guy named Reinhard Koenig von Faschenfeld, and he had uh, been a motorcycle racer, a guy with some nobility and a uh, little money behind him, but he'd never been able to really be the top guy in European motorcycle racing until he started figuring out, because it was a very tactile sport, motorcycle racing, you're out in the wind. He started working on the aerodynamics, and he ended up working on the aerodynamics on his motorcycle and competing with the factories. So he became very interested in aerodynamics and came up with some initial studies. He went to uh, the uh, Technical Institute in uh, Berlin, and uh, came up with some ideas. Uh, he did a thesis on improving bus design, of all things, hmm. where you could add more people, stretch the back end out, uh, instead of coming to a point like with the traditional teardrop shape, which had been patented by another great uh, early designer, a guy named Paul Jure, instead of coming out to a point, which was the ideal shape that he developed on the, working for Zeppelin, uh, which was impractical for the street because you couldn't make a car that hung out over the back, figured out you could get almost the same speed by getting it, keeping the lines the same, and then chopping the tail off abruptly. <laughs> so he tried to get a patent on that and uh, had not yet finished his schooling. So they said, well, if you'll allow the German government to take over your patent and, and uh, we'll allow you to work at FKFS with uh, Wunderbald Kahn, uh, who was the, the primary uh, designer of uh, airplanes and cars at that time. So he went to work there, and they did uh, some very, very interesting studies on automobiles for cars that no longer exist, cars called Vondrer and Ley, which eventually became Audi. But um, they were they were really radical-looking cars, and they'd been seen by the German press and some of the people around, and they were so different than everything else at that time that there was a complete rejection of the idea because they were considered so ugly. Hmm. But anyway, all that information went down. Uh, when the end of the war came, uh, the Allies went through, found these papers in Germany, made copies of them, sent them to all the American automotive manufacturers in the form of little mimeograph sheets, about eight pages. And it's all in German. There were no photographs. There was no drawings, but some little tiny line drawings that indicated what these special lines on the roof line and the chopped off tail would gain in comparative advantage with a conventional shape. So I tried to show that to Bill Mitchell when I was uh, working for him on the uh, Stingray project. Mm-hmm. And he looked at it. And of course, he had the same attitude that the, uh, the German media had at the same time. He just said, kid, that's the ugliest looking stuff <laughs> I've ever seen now. Let's just get back and do what we're doing here. So I sort of put those ideas away, and when I left to go back to California to start my race driving career, and the opportunity came up with Shelby, I explained that I had, you know, some information that I thought would would apply if we could uh, build a new body, and uh, 
at first he was very, very skeptical of the idea, but I managed to convince him that it was worthwhile. So that I, I drew it all up so that I could show it to the rest of the team at Shelby American. We were about uh, 10 people at that time. And, of course, they had the same <laughs> response that everybody else had. They said, God, that's just ugly. We can't do it. It, it won't work. But fortunately, Ken Miles, who had, had seen what the Germans had done just before World War II with the Silver Arrow and Mercedes, realized that they did have some you know, great ideas on. And he convinced Carol to let me continue with the idea. So Carol uh, gave me a crashed Cobra. Actually, it was a car that Skip Hudson had uh, crashed at Daytona the previous year. The flywheel had come loose and sheared the steering, and Skip had crashed it. So we had the uh, crash Cobra Roadster. Uh, the body was uh, removed. We reverse engineered all the drawings uh, on the chassis, and I used that as the basic, uh, the hard points to uh, figure out what the lines were going to be on the car. And I just uh, sat Miles down in that chassis and got him down as far down as low and as far back in an ideal position. And we uh, took some string and some masking tape and uh, sort of built a cockpit around him very, very rudimentary so I could get some basic dimensions. And that became the basics of the uh, Daytona Cobra. And the longest lead item that we had to produce for that car was the windscreen. We had only 90 days between that time and the first race at Daytona. Wow. So uh, I called a a friend of mine that was in the the Trans Am uh, series, and he worked at PPG at Pittsburgh Plate Glass and said, can you build me a windscreen? I'd looked all over every place in Los Angeles, measuring every windscreen I could find to see if I could find something that would be narrow enough that uh, fit my dimensions, and there was nothing out there. So I got PPG to agree that they'd make us a windscreen. It couldn't be compound curves. It could only be two curves in two directions. With that compromise, I, I drew up the windscreen even before I designed the car, sent that off and said, okay, we'll, uh, we'll build the glass first because we can always change the aluminum, but we can't change the glass. <laughs> sure. So that, be, that became the, uh, the, the lead item on, on des- designing the Daytona. And then from that point on, uh, I laid the, the lines out as minimally as I could over the existing chassis. What I did is I, I drew it all up in quarter scale. I didn't even have a drawing board in there because I never told Carol that I'd worked at GM as a designer or anything. Oh, my gosh. Uh, so I didn't even have a drawing board at that time. And I laid the whole thing out on the floor in the uh, in the accounting office on butcher paper. <laughs> You know, we didn't have any money. That's the first thing I asked Carol. I said, what's their budget? And he said, well, we don't have one. So uh, I couldn't even go out and buy any vellum or tools or anything to draw anything. But uh, My gosh. So I drew the whole thing out on the floor of the accounting office, went down to the market and got big rolls of butcher paper and drew the whole thing up in, uh, in quarter scale. And then what I did is I photographed all the section lines in uh, with my little Olympus 30 my 35 millimeter camera so that I had them on slides, each of the section lines at the important points on the car. Then I projected those up on the wall. And of course I knew what the height was and the width was. So with a vertical line and a horizontal line and a dimension on it, I, I refocused the slide on that, uh, on that drawing again on butcher paper and did all the section lines uh, in full size. Then we, you know, I just staple those to big pieces of three eighths inch plywood, and we cut those out with a jigsaw, and uh, and built the first buck to uh, to do the Daytona. And that buck in uh, in uh, was set on that crash chassis. Uh, we sent that over to Cal Metal Sheep down in uh, downtown Los Angeles, who had was very famous. Uh, they had a bunch of Yoder power hammers that would, had been used in the World War II aircraft industry. They would bought these hammer surplus. That was their specialty, was uh, making all kinds of uh, metal forms in aluminum and steel. And again, through this whole small community of race car builders in Southern California, I learned that that's where most of the Indianapolis car bodies were initially shaped. Hmm. And then they were sent back to the initial guys, the 12 great guys that built Indy cars. And they'd take those panels and then reshape everything, weld it all together, and build the Indy cars. Well, so that's where I took my buck. And they formed up the panels, and then we brought it back to Shelby American and started welding it up uh, full size. 
So about that time, there was a tremendous, tremendous resistance on the idea of the car because nobody wanted to be involved with it. They considered it extremely lucky, but uh, I considered myself lucky I was continued because Ken Miles had uh, convinced Shelby that we should go ahead with it. There was kind of one other outsider on the crew at that time, a guy named John Olson, a very bright young uh, fabricator guy that came out of New Zealand. He wasn't part of the Southern California clique of hot rodders because their whole goal was that they believed that Shelby should, you know, scrap this whole idea of going sports car racing and build an Indy car. That was their idea of what real racing was. So this whole idea of building a GT car uh, was completely foreign to them and they wanted no part of it. Mm -hmm. So luckily I had Miles as a, behind the project and John Olson, who was this really young fabricator guy from New Zealand. Most of the New Zealand guys are just great. They're very, very uh, self-starters, great abilities, can do everything. So uh, John and Ken and myself pretty much put the uh, the first panels together, built the book, got it down there, and got it going. And by then, people started to see that maybe there was a possibility. A couple more guys came over and began helping us on their own time at night. And we were still working off in the corner. This wasn't an accepted project. But uh, we got the car fairly well built. And at that point, uh, Shelby had received so much resistance on the project that he decided that he better get some some uh, an authority to come in there and, and look at the project and see if it was uh, really uh, really the right thing to do. Because at that point, you know, he was beginning to have to spend some money. Couldn't get the money out of Ford at that point. Goodyear was helping us primarily on it. So he asked a very uh, well-known um, airplane racer and uh, aerodynamic consultant of the industry at that time in Southern California, a fellow named Benny Howard, who was also a Texan and a longtime friend of Carol's, to come over and look at what we were doing. You know, here's the car about oh, 60%, 70% complete. You know, but you can see what it looks like because the form was all underneath with the uh, with the wooden form underneath and some of the panels over the top, and we were starting to put it together. So he brings in Benny Howard and, and uh, asks Howard to look the car over, who walks around and looks at it, and, of course, it doesn't look like anything that he's ever seen because at that time the, the best-looking race cars in the world came out of Italy, and they all had sort of a, a tapered back end on them, like the original Paul Jure teardrop shape. Mm-hmm. So here's this very looking square looking car with a chopped off back end and everything on it. Carol says, well, explain to Howard, you know, why this thing is going to work. So I started explaining about the papers that I'd read from Wunderbell Com and Faschenfeld. Surprisingly, uh, Benny Howard had never heard of these guys. And he had been such a famous airplane racer in his own right. He'd won the Thompson Trophy in 1935 uh, with the Howard monoplanes and stuff, which was the Learjet of its day. Uh, you know, he just looked at everything I said, and, and he said, you know, well, what's what's the frontal area that you got here? So I gave him the number, and he made a few calculations, and he said, he said, how much horsepower do you got? And I said, we got 385. He says, well, if you expect this thing to go anything over 185 or 90, he says, you're going to have to have, you know, more, more than five or 600 horsepower, you know. He says, it'll never work. So... Uh, that was a major, major setback at that point because that, uh, with his authoritative appraisal of the project, Shelby was pretty much now really thinking we were going in the wrong direction. So they went off to lunch, and he comes back, and he says, you know, Howard says we're wasting our time. So I said, well, I think the Germans knew where they were going, and we're already this far. Let's continue on it. And he just looked at me for a long time. He <laughs> says, boy, you better be right. And he just walked away. Well, I hope you're enjoying this insider story to the Daytona Coupe with the legendary Peter Brock. If you want to hear the rest of the story and the second half of his interview, just log into com. Peter Brock, Part 2. And you'll get to hear even more inspirational stories about Peter's life around automobiles, racing, hang gliding, and more. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah. Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up 
a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah!